Hello. Today we are going to discuss about ovarian torsion. Before we study about the ovarian torsion, we need to be aware of the structures in the pelvis that is supporting the ovary that are the infundibulopelvic ligament, also known as the suspensory ligament of the ovary, which joins the ovary to the pelvic sidewall. The primary ovarian vessels are likewise located in this ligament. The utero-ovarian ligament also connects the ovary to the uterus. An ovarian torsion is a process that occurs when the ovary twists over the ligaments that support it in the adnexa. The fallopian tube often twists with the ovary and is then referred to as adnexal torsion. The ovary receives blood from both the uterine and ovarian arteries. Twisting of these ligaments can cause edema, venous obstruction, artery compression, and, ultimately, ovarian blood supply loss. When the blood flow is disrupted, this can result in a variety of symptoms, including extreme pain. This is a true surgical emergency that, if not treated right away, could result in necrosis, ovarian loss, and infertility. Now, let us discuss the risks. An ovarian mass with a diameter of 5 cm or more is the greatest risk factor for ovarian torsion. The ovary's likelihood of rotating on the axis of the two ligaments keeping it in suspension is increased by the bulk when there is a mass. The mass could be anything ranging from neoplasms and cysts. Another risk is pregnancy and patients receiving fertility treatments. This is due to swollen follicles on the ovary. However, torsion is still possible in healthy ovaries, particularly in young people. When we talk about the incidence, females of all ages can get torsion, however reproductive age women are more likely to experience it. Ovarian torsion ranked sixth among surgical emergencies at a women's hospital over a 10-year period, accounting for 2.7%. Most women with torsion who were of reproductive age had a benign ovarian tumor. Let us understand the pathophysiology. Remember the infundibulopelvic and utero-ovarian ligaments which serve as the ovary supporting ligaments and the blood supply to the ovary? When the ovary twists over them, these ligaments are torn causing swelling and blood flow restriction. Initial obstruction of the venous outflow is followed by interruption of the artery input as a result of increasing edema which results in ovarian necrosis, infarction, bleeding, and possibly peritonitis. Right side torsion is more common than the left as a result of the sigmoid colon's placement on the left side of the pelvis. We will now see the symptoms and signs. The commonest symptom of ovarian torsion is unilateral or rarely bilateral pelvic pain. The pain is sharp, dull, continuous, or intermittent pain are all possible and it may radiate to the flank, back, or abdomen. According to one study, postmenopausal women frequently experience dull, ongoing pain as opposed to premenopausal women, who more frequently experience intense, stabbing pain. If the ovary is torsionally and detorsionally changing, symptoms may or may not be intermittent. Additionally, the patient may experience related nausea and vomiting. If the ovary has already become necrotic, fever might be present. In the event that the torsion involves a tubo-ovarian abscess, the patient may also experience atypical vaginal bleeding or discharge. Torsion in infants might cause feeding difficulties or crying very loud. We will now discuss about the physical examination. The patient's abdomen may be sensitive in general, specifically in the lower abdomen and pelvic region, or not at all. It was discovered that abdominal soreness was absent in up to one-third of patients. Additionally, there can be an abdominal mass. The patient may already have ovarian necrosis if they exhibit guarding, stiffness, or rebound tenderness. In order to more accurately assess for masses, discharge, and cervical motion pain, every patient should also undergo a pelvic exam. When we look in the practical sense, we must remember that time is very precious in cases of ovarian torsion. Keeping that in mind, the best and the quickest way of diagnosing a torsion is by performing a Doppler ultrasound. It is necessary to perform both a transvaginal and pelvic ultrasound. Depending on a variety of criteria, such as the technician's ability and the patient's anatomy, ultrasound has a reported sensitivity of about 84% for ovarian torsion. 
CT and MRI are not typically utilized to detect ovarian torsion but to rule out other abdominal pathologies like acute appendicitis. Direct observation of a rotated ovary during surgery allows for the final determination of the diagnosis of ovarian torsion. For this reason, the patient must undergo surgical assessment if clinical suspicion persists despite reasonably normal lab results and ultrasound imaging. Surgical detorsion, performed preferably by a gynecologist, is the treatment for ovarian torsion. Surgeons should try to salvage the ovaries by determining whether or not they are viable in females of reproductive age. A twisted ovary should typically be directly visible during surgery using a laparoscopic method. The majority of the time, visualization is used to assess viability. Although the blood supply in a dark, swollen ovary with hemorrhagic lesions may be impeded, the organ is frequently still recoverable. There are numerous differential diagnoses for female stomach discomfort. Ectopic pregnancy in a patient of reproductive age must first be ruled out with a beta-HCG. This can effectively be ruled out if the beta-HCG test results are negative. An intrauterine pregnancy detected by ultrasonography, if positive, greatly reduces the likelihood of an ectopic pregnancy but does not exclude a heterotopic pregnancy. Another condition is an ovarian cyst. On ultrasonography, both may also show free fluid in the pelvis. However, cyst rupture frequently happens during sexual activity and is typically accompanied by a quick, intense pain. Lower pelvic pain from a tubo-ovarian abscess can be present, but it normally develops more gradually and is accompanied by a fever. Right-sided pelvic discomfort, nausea, vomiting, and fever are all signs of appendicitis. Leukocytosis may be detected in lab results, and CT imaging should help distinguish it from ovarian pathology. Pyelonephritis, diverticulitis, and pelvic inflammatory disease are further differential diagnoses. In summary, if clinical suspicion is high, the most crucial and urgent consultation should be with a gynecologist and should take place before confirming investigations. The longer an ovary goes without blood supply, the less chance it has of recovering its function. As usual there are quiz questions. Pause this video and answer them. Comment your answers below. As usual please like, comment and subscribe if you find this video useful as this will motivate me into doing more videos like this. Don't forget you can request your biology or medicine topics via the Google form that is linked in the description below. Thank you and see you all in the next video.